back to live. Great. Okay. Okay. So, welcome to the next part. Um, now we will do, I will um, give a short raster introduction to GrassJS for small exercises. Introduce you to the computational region concept. This is essentially uh, the <coughs> extent and resolution of your current working environment. And uh, well, the first and most basic uh, task is obviously to import and export spatial data. Like most other GIS software packages, uh, we are using GDAL to do raster and uh, import and export. Also, vector import and export is done through GDAL, in this case, through the OGR part of GDAL. GDAL is um, also used by QGIS, for example. Saga should also use GDAL. Uh, ESRI uses GDAL. Um, most pack software, GIS software packages that I'm aware of use that GDAL thing. It supports many, many different formats. Um, I will explain that shortly. So, the computational region is defined by the region extents and the raster resolution or also by the region extent and the number of rows and columns from which you can then calculate the raster resolution. Region extent means actually the northern, southern, western and eastern boundaries um, in which any raster operation will take place. This is um, important, for example, again, if you have raw data from different sources, for example, if you have... Uh, Modis data and Landsat data, they come in different projections, in different sizes, and so on. And your study area is only covering a small part of the tile. Then you set the computational region to your study area, and um, then everything, all calculations will only take place in the study area. This is saving a lot of uh, time and space. We also have a raster map region. That means a raster map, um, raster data, a DEM, Landsat, Modis, whatever. They are defined first by their coordinate reference system, then by the number of rows and columns, and by the northern, southern, western, and eastern bounds. And this raster map region is um, obviously um, unique for each raster data set and independent of the computational region. So each raster map has its own values, and the computational region overrides the raster region. I, we will demonstrate that soon. We also have a display region. Display region means, are we still there? Yes. So. Now I zoom to the whole map. Now the display is identical to the extents of the vector data in this case. If I zoom in somewhere, somewhere, then obviously the display is no longer matching the extents of the spatial data I'm displaying. So the display region can be changed on the fly, but usually does not have any effect on the computational region. But a user can set the current computational region from the display region. We will do exercises, or I will demonstrate this concept. The main import module is called ringgdal. Um, you find it under File, Import, Raster Data, Common Import Formats, and um, here, you, uh, this is the dialog to import the data. Now we 
are going to import this elev uh, um, ele elevation data set for North Carolina. This data set is available on the website of the course. And just to show what it looks like for me here, this is my folder where I have all the archives with the data and I have extracted this thing here and now you should also have this LF state 500 meter TIFF GeoTIFF file. For Linux users it is um, easiest if you go to if you open a terminal in the folder where you have these data sitting. For Windows users, this is not possible. So on Linux, open terminal here and then off you go. This is what <coughs> I should have done previously. <coughs> okay, we will follow the steps here. In this case, in my case, I'm closing this dialog. I go to File, Import Raster Data, Common Import Formats. I'm using the grass session that is still open. Okay, so here I use uh, specify the source type, and then I browse to this TIFF file, select the TIFF file and open it. And then it is shown here. Um, for Windows users, there should be, if you use GWAS 7, um, There should be a setting <coughs> where you can set the current working directory. This makes use, uh, is useful for you, where you can set the working directory to the directory where you downloaded all the sample data. And then you don't have to do the you don't have to browse to that folder all the time. So you need when you have opened this dialog, import dialog, to browse to the location where you have extracted this LF state TIFF file. Okay? So, does everybody have the same? So you see the layer name displayed here and the suggested name for the grass raster map. Anybody has any problems? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Did you use it from the command line or from the? Ah, okay. From the command line, it looks different. This is gene a generic wrapper, but you can also use the command line version, which should
look like this. Okay. So in this case, um, you don't have the, the options are a little bit different between this dialog and the other one. In this case, you um, again have to browse to that file, and then for you, it should look like this. Yes. Okay, then... You have to specify, in this case, a name for the output raster map, which is ideally, let me place them next to each other. So these are the two versions which actually do the same thing. This is the name of the output raster map that I am using. So you can, of course, use whatever else you want. <laughs> you can also modify the name uh, in this dialog by clicking on it, but I don't want to modify it here. Already exists. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, you have already imported it, apparently. What if I go here? Yeah. Um, Oh, this is only the layers that you selected for display. This is not w everything that's available. Let me see if I have loaded that already. Ah, you are in permanent, right? Okay. This very same file is uh, raster data are already loaded in permanent, but I want to just demonstrate the import of the data. In this case, if you are in permanent, you have the option to file import common format in allow output files to overwrite existing files. This will overwrite any existing stuff. So I select this, open all files so far. Um, I click on import, and now it's imported. Close. In your case, you click on run after you have specified the output name, and then you essentially get the same. I don't do this now because, uh, well, I could. In this case, yeah, in, in this case, to, the one that you the yes, this uh, option. So the the GUI dialog for all GRASS modules is usually organized by. We have some required input, uh, and then there's usually an optional tab. If you go on the optional tab. There is um, somewhere this option here, allow output to overwrite. Okay, if I click on one here, I get this error, it's already existing. If I want, have reason to do this again, I go on optional, allow output files to overwrite existing files, run. Then I get a warning that it's already existing, but it will be overwritten. So, 
once we have done this, in my case, it is already added to the display, to the layer manager, but deactivated with this button here, you can toggle display or not. Has everybody imported the data? Okay, then I close everything here, close this one, close that one, go to my map display, and display it. You um, <coughs> can organize the layers here simply by dragging them. Here I want to have the roads on top of the elevation, and therefore I simply drag the elevation down, and then I have the elevation below the roads. What you now see here is that the display extends they were kept, they were not modified. Now we only see a part of the elevation. If I want to see the whole elevation data, I go on to this little button, zoom to selected map layers. The selected map layer is the one that's highlighted here, in my case, ele um, the elevation data. Now I click on this and here I see all of North Carolina and the roads, major roads for part of North Carolina. So. <coughs> the color table or the coloring that we see here is um, so-called rainbow color which is okay, but it's not really a standard elevation coloring scheme. Therefore, I would like to change it to a standard elevation coloring scheme, which we can do by, with a right click here, and then set color table. It's exactly the same we can get by going to raster, manage colors, and color tables. It's the same thing. I would like you to open this dialog now. If, um, and the name of the raster map is already filled in here automatically. Then I click on colors. And here are predefined coloring schemes. I am first trying SRTM coloring scheme. SRTM is an um, elevation coloring scheme um, suitable for the whole world. That means it uh, displays where it's meant to show the whole range from zero to 8,000 something meters. If I click on run, something happens. Okay, now I get a more conventional elevation coloring scheme automatically applied. Yes? Um, yes, uh, you go on define, uh, in, in grass 7, this is not called colors, but define, define the coloring, but otherwise it's the same, so name of co color table in your case here, and there you see, you go to, yeah. I'm going to try a different coloring scheme. We have another one called elevation, which is more suitable if we are only looking at a small area. So it's a different one. And here the 
mountains are more prominently sticking out. Whereas we have not really a difference at low elevation, so zero as an ocean is not much different from zero point something just above zero. And we have yet another one, which is called Etopo. I can try this one. So this is for my taste here to uniform. And I'm going back to SRTM. So, of course, applying color rules does not change the raster values. The raster values are all still the same. So, I don't change the elevation values, I only change the color that's associated with the elevation values to display the stuff. And uh, here, in case with SRTM, I get, I can clearly um, see where the ocean starts. So, here we have the Atlantic. The mountains are not as prominently sticking out as for the other coloring scheme, but um, overall this gives a nice impression of the landscape we have there and the elevation differences. Yeah, so in my opinion, the coloring, the color rules or that you want to use is a matter of taste and also what you want to do with it. If you want to use elevation just as a background layer for map composition, you would probably use a different scheme. Okay. And well, as you have seen, uh, grass comes with lots and lots of predefined color tables, as uh, you could see in the drop down menu here, but you can also create your own color tables. Uh, or import other color tables, for example, for um, land cover, land use data. Very often you get a predefined or suggested coloring scheme for um, the green data, for example, or for other land, color, land cover, land use data. The coloring scheme comes in a separate file and you convert, can convert that um, to a grass readable format to apply this coloring scheme or come up with your completely custom scheme. Yes? Is there any special reason for running in the world? Sorry? When you choose the color table, yeah. um, it's running now, it's not applied. Is there a special reason for that? Oh, uh, no. With that, um, I don't know. The, I'm not that much involved in the development of the GUI. So someone decided it's apparently more appropriate to use the word apply instead of run. So, but that's the same thing. Yeah? Oh, okay. That should be synchronized. <laughs> that's true. Which version are you using? Okay. Uh, so in grass six, I have run all the time. Okay. Uh, yes, but that should be synchronized if there is a difference. Usually when you run a command um, through the, this uh, interface, SRTM, or apply something, um, this tab here, the command output will be automatically activated and will show you what happened. 
This is also interesting if anything went wrong or if there were any warnings or errors, everything will be pr uh, printed here. So usually you don't have to worry about what is here, but if something did not work as expected, some useful, useful information should be available here. Okay. You can also copy that command, copy here, and then it's copied to the clipboard. Um, this is useful if you want to set up a script. For example, if you um, say import modus NDVI, yeah, and you have a time series of modus NDVI, you don't want to click every time on this dialog, select the NDVI coloring scheme, Instead, you would copy that command, write a little script that automatically applies the NDVI. That would then mean color equal NDVI. Um, apply that coloring scheme to the just imported raster data. That means um, for, for this batch processing or automated processing, you can try the commands first here with the GUI. If you are happy with the settings and everything, you copy that command, paste it into a simple text file, and after that, simply run that text file as a script. This is possible on all um, operating systems. You can also set up a script on Windows and then run the script on Windows. Okay. As we have seen here, no matter what color table we apply, everything around here stays the same, namely white. This is because there are no data. Um, in this case, there are really no data in the input. No data means it has been masked out or the data are simply uh, unknown. And uh, these no data are usually ignored. There are two reasons why this could be right. First, because the input data are really no data, or we can also mask out certain areas. So if we, only, if we are interested in a particular study area and want to ignore everything outside the study area, we can set a mask for that study area. That means only values inside that mask are processed and everything outside is ignored. This is sometimes really substantially speeding up processing time because everything that's no data or unknown is simply ignored and the processing goes on to the next um, pixel and pro tries to process that. That means if we set a mask, um, all data outside the mask are ignored, even if the input data might show valid data there. Well, as I said, this is uh, highly useful if you have a small study area, and this also means you don't have to clip your input data first. You simply set the computational region and the mask, and then off you go. With um, Sometimes with other GIS, some other, other GIS software packages, you have to first clip your input data and then do the processing, but uh, not in GRASS. So, I said, said quite a bit about the computational region. Um, we can first have a look at the computational region. One very simple way would be in the map display, there's an option, oops, not this one. We have this button, various zoom options. In GRAS 7, there's a new button um, with these dots. Uh, the magnifying glass with the dots. You have to go with the mouse over the buttons to get the tooltip. What I want is 
to do is this action here, zoom to computational region. Because this is a very commonly used feature, um, it has gained its own button here in the main toolbar in GRA7. In GRA6, it doesn't have this yet. So if I click on here, it zooms to something, which is in this case, in my case, this area with these extents. As you can immediately see, this does not correspond to the elevation data set, but rather to the uh, Rhodes major vector data set. To get some more information, actually numbers, we go to settings, region, and use this entry, set the region. We have all sorts of possibilities here. Now I only want to have to print the current region. So I go on the print tab and activate this option here. Go on run and then I see something here. The First comes information about the coordinate reference system. This information cannot be changed. What we can change is the north, south, west, and east extents, the bounds, and also the resolution. <coughs> okay. Um, sorry. Um, yes. Yes, this is, was present already. Um, I have prepared that in the sample data set, but we can set this now. Um, this is stored internally somewhere in a file by grass, and it, if we print, if we want to see the current settings, we, uh, Grass is simply reading the currently stored settings. It doesn't, it's no concern to you where the stuff is stored and how. Uh, it's um, in a way also a security feature that uh, users cannot accidentally modify that file and render it unreadable. I want to show you how to change this. So one possibility would be, let me close this color dialog. Again, I can do a right click here and set computational region from the selected map. So I right click on the elevation data. and set the computational region from the selected maps. There are again different ways to do this. Now it's printing something here. I have left this open. As you can see, the coordinate reference system did not change, but the north, south, uh, west and east Extents were changing and the resolution is now set to 500 meter. Previously, it was 10 meter. If I want to see, display the difference in graph 6, I go again to various zoom options, zoom to computational region, and now it shows the whole elevation map. Okay, what I have done here, map layers, right click on the elevation thing, data set computational region from the selected map. Exactly the same can be done by with this dialog. 
The dialog again came from here, settings, region, set the region. This will show you this dialog. I can select the raster map used to define the new computational region. Click on run and it will do exactly the same. If you want to see the internal command actually used, the command is displayed here, here at the bottom. And yeah, so that was again another an alternative to right clicking on the layer, the displayed layer. <coughs> yes? If you have several layers and you can even choose to which layer you want to have. So a cluster, for example? Yes. No, no, this is not done automatically. Um, you can always select, say, for example, you have Landsat scenes. They overlap a little bit, but you need for your study area four different scenes located here, here, there, and there. Then you can select all four at once, and then uh, the command will internally um, pick the westernmost, the easternmost, the northernmost, and the southernmost boundary to make sure that all tiles are covered at the same, uh, that everything is inside the computational region. For masking, you can also do the same. There are various different ways to create a mask. Um, so you don't have to move no. Um, poor. Um, you don't. Yeah, it's yes. Um, you don't have to mosaic. In case of Landsat, Landsat is a little bit tricky. It's not easy to mosaic Landsat scenes because Landsat scenes, one scene and the neighboring scene, scene are usually coming from different dates. You need a lot of luck. <laughs> to get matching stuff. So usually you process each Landsat, or I would process, at least pre-process each Landsat scene individually. At least do something like atmospheric correction, maybe do some classification, and then afterwards try to patch the two to, to do the mosaic and make sure that in the overlapping part I get a nice transition and no edge effects. Uh, with uh, modus, it's different. Modus tiles, first of all, don't overlap. And modus, um, usually you don't have um, edge effects. So you don't have to take that much care. You can mosaic the stuff, but you don't have to. It's easier to mosaic it before. But it's not required, essentially. Not really required. Okay, um, so we were importing raster data, and usually when we import raster data, the whole thing as it exists, like in this case a GeoTIFF, has been imported as it is. There's no automated clipping done, so it always imports the full raster data set. After that, we can do some post-processing, uh, like clipping it if you want to save disk space or do other processing steps. The same uh, if we are exporting raster data. The export is limited to the current region. That means if I set my region to some mountainous area here, and then export the elevation again, only this part here will be exported, not the whole stuff. So this is like implicit clipping. Okay. Similarly, well, we used r.in.gdal for importing 
raster data and r.out.gdal we can use to export raster data. Um, nowadays, the number of formats supported by this gdal library is somewhere around 100, I guess, so you can pick any of these 100 formats. The default is GeoTIFF because GeoTIFF is most widely used and pretty much every GIS software recognizes GeoTIFF. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. Let's export. this raster map again. Um, with rrgdal, so the, I will point you to the dialog. That would be under file, export, raster map, common export formats. Here it's already pre-filled. If I would have more, actually I can export anything that's available. I could also export data from the permanent map set, which is in my case not the current map set. This is legal because I'm not modifying these data, I'm, but I pick this one. Now I type anything. Export, yes. You can use any name you want. Um, usually, you don't have to worry about any optional settings. So here you can, if you want, select the format. Um, as you can see, quite a few formats are supported, but, oh, interesting, even R, wow. This is not coming from GRASS, this is coming from GDAL. G GRASS is simply picking up what GDAL is supporting. But I leave all the defaults, the file type you can, um, also select the file type, but usually this is figured out automatically by GRASS, so no need to worry. Um, so all we need to fill in usually is here in the required tab, the name of the raster map we want to export and the name of the output raster file. Ah. ah, okay. No difference. It will behave exactly the same. The reason is um, that if you now copy in GRASS 7, if you copy the command, the output file format will be explicitly defined. Here, in this case, the output file format is not explicitly defined. So if the standard, if the default file format would change from one version to another, this command would produce a different output. In GRASS 7, you will always, because the, the file format is explicitly defined, it will always produce GeoTIFF output, even if, you, if something changes between versions. Okay, run, then it does something. There's a error coming from, this error six is coming from GDAL. Um, for GeoTIFF, you cannot, you cannot assign a color table to GeoTIFF files if, if 
uh, the data type is not byte or unsigned integer. In this case, um, we exported with a float 32-bit data type. This has been figured out automatically by GRASP because this elevation data set is actually 32-bit uh, floating point. And the GeoTIFF um, specifications, they do not support color tables for this particular data type. There's no, no need to worry about that. Color table is anyway only a matter of taste and color tables are not widely supported. Not, there's no standard format for exporting, importing color tables. Now, I have already zoomed to this um, mountainous area in my case. What I do now is various zoom options. I set the computational region from the display extent. That means the computational region will then be exactly matched this, will an exact match to what I see here. Okay. I still have my dialog open here, required. Now I simply change the output name. Export it again. I get exactly the same. Um, output with the same error flag, but what I want to demonstrate to you is what you can here see immediately, this um, LF export full TIFF has a size of 4.3 megabytes, and the zoom export has a size of only 108 kilobytes. So it really only exported what you see here. If you would display the two geotiffs, you would also see the difference. The one is at full extent, and the other one is at this zoom extent. The Ah, the export is done to your current working directory on Linux. On Windows, it is actually safer to browse to the current, to where you want to store the stuff. So you don't get lost. What you can also do on Windows, cancel. You simply write the name as I did here. Then you click on this Browse button. And then, well, Windows Explorer obviously looks different than my Linux file browser here. But you also see where you are. And then you remember where you are. And then use Windows Explorer to navigate to this output folder and have a look what you find there. In GRASS 7, yes. Okay. Under settings, in the GUI under settings, working environment, there's somewhere an entry change working directory. Working. Yeah. Yeah. But this, for Linux, this applies only to commands that are invoked uh, through the GUI. So if you use the command line, as in this thing here, the command line, um, 
you have to change the command, uh, the working directory with the standard Linux command change directory cd to where I want to go. Or even easier, on Linux you start the terminal or you first you go to the directory you, where you want to work in and then you start grass. Then you are immediately there where you want to have all your where you have all your input and output data. Okay. If you have a command console, this applies to all operating systems, also Windows. You can also use GDAL info. GDAL info is a very, very useful tool. It's, in my opinion, heavily underestimated. Um, Export. So this is the output of GDAL info. Here we see the extents of the full export. I can do the same for the zoom stuff, and here are the extents of the zoomed export. Or very quickly, the size is 202 by 133, and here above, the size is 1,678 by 669, immediately showing the difference. So it really only exported the selected, uh, the, the current computational region. Come on. When you use the GUI, you don't have to worry about this white space stuff. This is all automatically handled by um, the GUI. But if you work on the command line, you have to... Output can also be path, full path to the location of the raster.tiff. And if there is any white space in there, you would need to use quotes, but uh, not through the GUI. Okay, short exercise on hydrological modeling. Um, we are loading a LiDAR data set. So what I do here is First I close various okay. I remove these. I don't want to use these um, anymore. I add a new raster map layer now. I want to use this 11 lit blah. Lit stands for LiDAR data, LiDAR elevation data set. Yes. Yes. File, map display, new map display window. Then you would have. Um, yeah, two of these windows, and each window would have its own tab. So then you can display different things in different windows. No. 
Um, no, they are completely independent. So, do we have this somewhere? I'm not 100% sure. Maybe I think in GRA7 there's a feature where you can open two map displays, display two different spatial data, and then um, zoom into the one map display and tell the other map display to follow the zoom in the one map display. So in this case, they can be linked. Um, uh, I think, I'm not sure. I heard that we want to implement that for the people working on the GUI. Um, but I'm not 100% sure if this is already existing. OK, I want to display the LiDAR data. What I see now is nothing. This is because I'm still displaying the current computational region, but this LiDAR data is sitting at a completely different place. Therefore, I have to click on Zoom to Map Display. Maybe for illustration where we are, I'm adding the elevation map for the whole country, for the whole county. And we are now sitting here. Something went wrong. Okay, did not work as expected. Yes. Yes? In my case, it's a very small region inside this elevation, yeah? Yes, this is correct. Yeah. So the elevation map um, had a resolution of 500 meter. This uh, LiDAR data set has a resolution of one meter, so it's really only a small part inside North Carolina. And first, we want to set the computational region to the new elevation raster. OK, just to show you again where we are here, where I got this one. This is in permanent. Here I selected it for display. OK, I set the computational region to this map. Very important. Now everything is restricted to the extents of that raster map and to the resolution, one meter in this case of this raster map. Is everybody there? Okay. To the exercise, uh, this is a surface flow accumulation using the grass command r dot watershed. Um, you find this command under raster, hydrologic modeling, watershed analysis. In GRAS 7, that should be pretty much at the same location. This watershed analysis module uses 
ja, as input an elevation model. There are various other input options which we ignore. There are various output options. Um, flow accumulation, drainage direction, basins, stream segments, half basins, and so on. New in GRASS 7 is the so-called topographic convergence index or topographic wetness index. Um, what we want to have here is only flow accumulation. So what did I say in the example? We only want flow accumulation, flow arc. For GRASS 6, only those of you that are using GRASS 6, you should enable multiple flow direction method. In GRASS 7, this is the default. You don't have to do anything. You, in GRASS 7, you only need to specify the flow accumulation output. Run. OK. You should see something like this. Actually, you should see exactly this. If you don't see this, something went wrong. Who does not see this? What do you see? <laughs> Yellow. Um, no. Check uh, the first question would be to check your computational region. It must match the LiDAR elevation. And have you specified the correct elevation model as input to the? The LiDAR model. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, computational region. Can you go to um, Einstellungen? Uh, region. Region. Uh, Anzeigen, yeah. Funky. Okay. Go to the map layer manager. You can close this one if you want. You we don't no longer need it. This one. This one. Close. Okay. The map below. This elevation lid. Okay, right click. Um, Arbeitsbereich. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you click on the the fields zeile output? Mm -hmm. One meter. Okay. okay. Now go to the watershed module. Uh, dialog is still open. Yes. Go to optional or yes. Ausgaben dürfen überschreiben. Yeah. Dieses da aktivieren und los. Yes. So somehow you managed to set the res resolution to 10 meter. That why that's why you had the blocky art. Okay. Blocky pixels. Now I did it on uh, one meter.
it's not working. Um, ah, <laughs> carton Ebenen. <laughs> so we must first activate this thing here, and then we can use this one. Yeah. Yeah. I no, not this here, but this is using the display. Uh, Whereas this is using the raster map, and the display is only it inherits like the current resolution it only adjusts the extents uh, but here this right click sets both the extents and the resolution and now if you go back to eingar um, ausgabe option okay Ah, okay. Du kannst es auch, aber auch überschreiben. Hier, damit. Okay. Aber egal. Yes, different. you are using Grass 6.4, yes. Okay. Um, this is fine. What you did not do is optional. You have not enabled MFD. Oh. So what you see here is the result of single flow direction. This is actually <coughs> quite nice, so this is not wrong. It is, if you compare the two results, you see immediately the difference. For LiDAR data, in my opinion, this multiple flow direction shows more realistic results. So this is a more natural looking pattern, which I wanted to show here anyways. Um, <coughs> you don't have to do that analysis as well. Um, oh no. Optional. Just to illustrate two different methods of um, accumulating surface flow. This is the standard, simplest single flow direction method. And this is a particular variant of multiple flow direction. So the difference is quite striking for LiDAR data. If you would do exactly the same comparison for the 500 meter elevation dam, you would not see any differences. You would only, you would need to calculate a difference map to actually pick up the difference. So this multiple flow direction is really kicking in at um, high resolution dams. You also see it at oceans or flat areas, but usually not. Just to, yeah, one quick example for hydrological analysis. <coughs> Um, yes, when we add, when I look, when I want to display a map, I have here a little list of, drop down list of all the data available to me. Um, if I want to have a look at this list generically, I can go to Manage Maps and Volumes, List. I can select the data type I want to see, in this case only raster data, one, and then here's output 
text output of all the stuff that we have available. Okay. I am not 100% sure if this is working for me. Um, this is an example for um, 3D. pseudo 3D display. You can activate this uh, 3D display, for example, here with the 3D view. And have to set the data. Um, I want to use the den, and as color, I want to use the flow accumulation. Okay, and redraw the stuff. Not working. Funky. It should work. I'm not. I guess I made something wrong here with my internal settings. So I'm leaving that again. So that was just a quick example on hydrological modeling. Um, GrassGS has, well, let's say, raster module groups for resampling, reprojection, geo rectification, um, a very versatile and useful map calculator, which can be used for many, many different things. Um, terrain analysis, hydrologic modeling, for example, um, as we just did, and various options for reports and statistics. Did I lose something? No. Um, including what is known as sonal statistics in um, various formats. Raster maps, you can load anything you want, digital elevation models, land cover, climatic time series, and so on. There's uh, also quite a bit on imagery maps, um, supported especially for pre-processing, Landsat, Mode, Spot, QuickBird, and so on, is supported for pre-processing and filtering. We will do a little bit on imagery processing later on. Okay. Um, additional dam analysis modules um, are available. I am not a big friend of filling depression areas. This is an old module. There's a new module in GRAS7 which is called r.hydrodem, which is doing hydrological conditioning using a least impact approach to render, well, hydrologically condition a digital, digital elevation model. Um, various ways to calculate flow lines, for example, with r.flow. GRAS7 has a new module called um, r.stream extract, which is a very versatile 
module to extract stream networks. Um, well, cost surfaces, we have some energy module, sun mask, our sun. View sheds, old module is called r.loss, loss for line of sight. The new module is called r.view shed. We have different interpolation methods. Um, this is only a small subset of what is actually available. Um, and we have a um, module to do preging, v.preg, which is internally calling R. Ah, yes. Yes. Yeah, in R that works only to a limit. Yeah. Only if the function is actually an R script. Mm -hmm. As soon as the function is calling C code, R, C code that is in R, you don't see the C code. Mm -hmm. So it only works to a limit. If you really want to go dig deep down how something is exactly calculated, in R as in uh, grass, you have to look at the source code. Yeah. Yeah. You can sure you can do that. Um, um, many, uh, yeah, R packages are actually R scripts, really sophisticated R scripts that are calling R functions. But the most of them, essentially, if you follow it down, so an R function is calling an R function is calling an R function is calling an R function, an R function yeah, is calling a C module, and in that C. Uh, code, you see what is actually happening. Yeah, and for that you have to use text editor, whatever, IDE, to look at that code. So there's no quick way, mm -hmm. but you, yeah. Um, let's see. Yes, where available, there is um, there are references in the manuals. Um, yeah. Do I still have this open? Uh, manual. This is simply you can also get exactly the same manual as a web page, so it's all HTML. Um, yeah, so here we have quite a few references for r.watershed. And yeah, there you can follow it up. Um, I prefer well, this in each, in the GUI, in each dialog, you have this, this manual tab. But sometimes it is easier to fire up the manual. Okay. Uh, display index. Sorry, second. Come on. Okay, this is the main index of the grass manual. You can open it in any browser. 
was the commands mm. there we have our dot watershed so this is a particularly long manual <laughs> so maybe <laughs> because it has actually here you see all the input and output options. R.watershed is one of the modules that really has lots and lots of options. As we have used it right now, we only had to specify input, output, and run. And it produced flow accumulation. But to explain everything that is done here, well, it needed quite a bit of text and quite a bit of references. I'm afraid in GRAS 7, the manual increased a little bit more. Even so, but this does not show immediately the source code. So for the source code, you download the source code and look at the source code directly, and then you can see how it is actually implemented. But this is not always easy, so to understand that code. But well, source code is there if you want. Um, yeah, I will quickly start. I will start with the vector intro format. This will partly be a repetition of what I explained previously. So GRASS has its own native vector format, which is one of the few truly topological vector formats. Um, it is also very versatile in the link of geometry features to attributes. If you're familiar with uh, shapefiles, S3 shapefiles, you know that there is something like a multi feature, multi polygon, multi line string, and so on. A multi polygon is a collection of polygons that all have the same ID. That is, all the polygons in a multi polygon object refer to the same entry in an attribute table. Um, <clears throat> this is also possible in GRASS, but um, in GRASS we have additionally the option that one object, say one polygon, can actually refer to several different entries in an attribute table, which is, um, I will explain later on. Um, objects can also be organized in layers, vector layers. The equivalent would be you have a folder with different shape files, and in OGR terminology, a shape file is regarded as a layer, and the directory where all the shape files are in is referred to as the data source. And uh, the GRASS vector format. Blah, can be translated to this data source layer organization. The OGC simple features, for example, um, shapefiles or KML or um, spatial light data need to be converted to topological vectors for GRASS in order to work with them properly. Uh, this conversion is usually done automatically during import and export. We have a database management system to manage the attributes of vectors. I introduced that previously. So GRASS is supporting SQLite, PostgreSQL, MySQL, ODBC, and also DBF. The default in GRASS 7 is SQLite because it's the most versatile and at the same time very simple database driver. Vector topology. So in GRASS, we have the different geometry types, point, centroid, line, and boundary. An area, which is the equivalent to a polygon, is constructed from boundaries and a centroid. Let's assume we have two areas. Let's assume we have Norway and Sweden. Uh, 
Then there is a boundary between Norway and Sweden, but only one boundary. Norway and Sweden are not two completely independent countries that do not know anything about each other. There is one boundary and the two countries agreed on that particular boundary. So this is why there is only one boundary. If you instead look at polygons, the polygons are spatially independent of each other. They, they do not know about any neighbors they have. So in a shapefile, Norway and Sweden do not know of each other. That means the, the boundary between Norway and Sweden is duplicated. It's once a boundary, a part of the polygon of the Norway polygon and once a part of the Sweden polygon. And these two boundaries not always, do not always match, which creates all sorts of problems, which you do not have if you use this topological construct, where there's only one common boundary between two adjacent areas. Then you create, build an area by following this circle here and build another area here. Um, you can use a century here to give the area an ID and attach attributes and have nodes that are connecting boundaries to each other. <coughs> so the boundary node concept is um, somewhat similar to graph theory where you have nodes and edges, which is again important for vector network analysis, which in turn means that this vector topological vector format can be used pretty much as it is for vector network analysis because nodes and edges are already defined. In grass, all types can be true 3D with a Z coordinate. So X, Y, Z is possible. Um, but you can uh, like enforce 2D representation to save disk space, for example. Import and export happens again with the v equivalently with the V dot in and V dot out modules. As for raster, for raster we have the R dot in and R dot out modules. The main modules that you would use is uh, v.in.ogr and v.out.ogr, which in the GUI is located in file import vector data, common import formats, and export vector map, common export format. When importing vector data, or raster data, by the way, it doesn't matter, I would always first try this common formats dialog. Only if there's good reason that this particular format is not supported, I would try one of those other ones. Uh, SRTM is a particular candidate where, um, which is not supported as far as I know by GDAL. And with vector maps um, the same, I would always first try OGR unless we have uh, text points or any other of these more esoteric, well, exotic file formats. I think this S3E00 is nowadays also supported by GDAL and the Garmin import is also supported by GDAL. So you have two options actually. The number of supported formats depends on your local installation, but uh, usually is somewhere above 50 different formats. So there's not only shapefile and KML, there's quite a lot out there in the wild. Okay, last exercise before the break, I guess.
we have a shape file called uh, NC boundary county in an archive that you have hopefully downloaded from the website of the course. It will, if you extract this NC boundary county TGZ, you should get this uh, subfolder called NC shape. And in this subfolder NC shape, there's a shape file. So you can look at this with your preferred file browser. I am cleaning up my grass session a little bit here. Um, that means I remove all the layers. By the way, if you always get this dialog here, this confirmation dialog, but if you don't want it, you can change this in the settings under settings preferences, there are various ask when removing lab layer, map layer from layer tree. Okay, apply. Good. Okay, import vector data, common import formats. Okay, format is by default, it assumes an S3 shapefile. I browse to that shapefile, which is here. Then I, in my case, I don't have to browse very far because I'm already, I set the current working directory accordingly. Now it looks like this, it lists the layer name. This is the OGR layer name and this is the name for the grass vector map. And I just keep the default settings like this. Does everybody? No? Okay. Um, I have been working, this is a special question. I have been working in uh, display two. Ah, okay. So yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I thought I will close it because I yes. wondered whether things are changed or not. And we asked, do you want to store current settings to workspace file? So uh huh. Um, you can safely say no, you will not lose any data. Uh, current, um, what it does is, when you have organized various layers here, and you have set the coloring scheme and selected, really put some effort into organizing all the stuff, and you want to keep these settings. These are just settings um, on what layers to display with what coloring and what options then um, you can save these settings to a workspace file. This is what you have been asked right now. Then the next time you start Grass, you can load these settings from file workspace, open existing workspace, and then it will load all the layers with the appropriate settings, which is quite useful sometimes for if you display many different layers and spend quite a bit of time to on the layout. Okay. I cannot select the shape file from the entire setting, so if I have time or shape, I um, cannot select if I have to go to directly access to the shape file. Uh -huh. This is import vector data. Daten, yeah. Uh, okay. This, but it makes nothing. Can you go back to the gehen? Blätter. Yeah. Um, eine weiter hoch. 
noch eine weiter hoch. Hast du den? Nee, der. Du hast das Archiv richtig entpackt. Ja. Okay. Dann äh, hm. habe ich nicht wirklich eine Erklärung dafür. Also es ist ja Shapefile. Also ja. Ist ja, ist ja ähm. Vielleicht ist es einfach ein Fehler in der Beta-Version. Nee, das ist ähm, irgendwas anderes. Kannst du mal einen ganz normalen Windows Explorer aufmachen? Mhm. Okay, und da hingehen, wo wir da sind. Dokumente, Norwegen. Okay. Dann in den NC äh, Boundary County Shape, ja. Mhm. NC Shape, ja. Und, hm, ähm, dann nimm das die, 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 die Ordneroption. Okay. Does everybody have this kind of dialog? Then click on import. This will take a little bit because now this is doing the conversion from non-topological to topological data. The topology, um, well, this topology, as I explained, the concept is generic. There is other GIS software that also uses this kind of topology. Not a lot of GIS software is using this kind of topology. But the particular implementation is grass specific. Unfortunately, there is no common topological vector format. Maybe PostGIS is getting somewhere to there. So PostGIS version 2 supports topology. And this could be used, maybe, as a data exchange format. But um, there is nothing really established, uh, like uh, Esprit shapefile or something else that's recognized by pretty much any other software. The problem is also, of all the software GIS packages out there, only very few, probably a handful, um, support vector topology. Okay. <clears throat> I get here a warning that input data are, uh, contains 3D features. Um, this is nothing really to worry about. In this case, it doesn't really make sense. Um, This dialog, for some reason, does not offer the option to force 2D out. Ah, yes. Ah, no, this is all fine. All fine. Sorry. If something goes went wrong or if any errors were encountered, there would be a warning at the end of the import telling you that something went wrong. And uh, usually it would also suggest some methods to clean these errors. Um, so when importing, 
you should in this case really read the output of the cleaning procedures and the summary of the topology building. The summary of the topology building is what we have here, building topology for a vector map boundary county. Um, this is all fine. Again, if anything would have gone wrong, there would be a warning or an error. This warning uh, only contains uh, 3D features, but for boundaries, we are not interested in 3D features. So in this particular case, we have um, 1,900, nearly 1,900 boundaries and 926 centroids. Um, and the areas and aisles that can be constructed from these boundaries. The cleaning procedures for area import, just a quick summary. Uh, it breaks polygons, removes duplicate boundaries, breaks boundaries again, removes duplicates again, removes small angles, at nodes, changes dangles and removes bridges. Um, so this is all quite a list, but all this is needed to convert non-topological vector data to topological vector data. And all this is done automatically. There's usually no reason, no use. Yeah, you don't have to worry about that unless something goes wrong. Unfortunately, quite often something goes wrong. <laughs> so. For example, with um, administrative areas, like country boundaries and so on, you would expect that country boundaries don't overlap. No, no territorial conflicts, country boundaries match. But uh, with many shapefiles out there, country boundaries do not match, they overlap, or they leave sliver polygons, and then you get errors during the import. Um, yeah, this is just what I explained. Building topology, everything looks good. Um, nothing to worry about in this case. So if something like this happens, number of incorrect boundaries, centuries outside area, duplicate centuries and so on, there would also be a warning and it would be in this case printed in blue, your warning, blah, 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 something is going wrong. And then if you don't know what to do now, ask on the Ask uh, Grass user mailing list or follow the suggestions of the module. There would be usually a hint what to do now. And this is, yeah. The last part, then I stop. Sorry, I am too long. Lunch break. Um, actually, I men mentioned pretty much everything before. Network analysis. There's also LiDAR analysis, like we have now in GRASS 7. Nice support for LiDAR, big LiDAR point clouds, which can be converted to digital surface or digital terrain models. Also LiDAR analysis. Uh, linear referencing system and uh, yeah, various other modules. In, you can browse the help manual page. Or if you have anything specific in mind, you are also very welcome to ask me on Friday for something special, uh, for some special analysis procedures if they are available in GRASS and then I can tell you yes or no, and also describe you how this is done. Yes? Um, I was still wondering if you import the raster of a vector, or a vector, um, are the data actually copied to the graph database? Yes. If you import um, raster or vector data with grass, uh, grass will add these data to the current location and map set. It will be physical, physically stored there as files in grass internal format. What you can also do, uh, especially with raster data, there's a command called r.external. 
which is not doing a full import, it is only creating a link to the data. So say you have this really big 10 gigabyte raster file and you don't want to import it because it's too big and taking too long, you simply create a link to it and then you can work with it like with any other data. Of course the link will only work as long as this external data exists. If you move it or modify it, then it breaks, sure. But uh, this r.external is a very useful feature that's available also both in GRAS 6 and GRAS 7. Uh, yes, yeah. So, yeah. Um, especially, well, a not uncommon situation would be that you and your colleagues, you have laptops, but the laptops have only limited disk space. So, if you work with um, spatial data nowadays, you can easily exceed the, the capacity of your hard drive, of the laptop. Then it's simpler to have a file server standing somewhere and you connect via NFS or whatever you want to that server and then access the grass data that are stored on that server. No need to create a link, you work directly on the server and you have your yeah, GUI and display and everything control on your laptop. So, yeah. Yeah, I would suggest to postpone any more questions to either during or after lunch break. <laughs>